and thank you for purchasing REFM's Real Estate Finance Level 2 Bootcamp. Over the course of this module, you will learn about basic and advanced principles of real estate finance and how they manifest themselves in Microsoft Excel. The content in this tutorial builds upon what we learned in the Level 1 Bootcamp, and it is progressive within the module. However, you can feel free to navigate to any topic at any time by clicking on the links that sit below the video. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and download the Excel file and open it up. You can find the Excel file in the order for this product, as well as in My Account Downloads. Open up the file and have it ready so that you can work within the file during the module. Let's start out by reviewing one of the conceptual underpinnings of finance, the time value of money, by going to the TVM Timeline tab. Whereas accounting is backward-looking, finance is forward-looking, meaning it involves the forecasting of future financial outcomes based on current assumptions. We know what has happened in the past, we stand today at time zero, and we have a high certainty about values today, but we have a significantly lower certainty about values and events as they will come to pass in the future. The concept of the time value of money is that if we were to have the ability to jump backwards and forwards in time and we knew the appropriate growth rate and discount rate to apply to a cash flow, we would theoretically be indifferent between having a dollar amount today or an equivalent dollar amount at some point in the future grown at that particular rate. The time value of money can be understood using this example. Let's say we sit here today at time zero and we have $100. And we feel that we could invest that $100 over the course of one year and earn a 4% return on that, meaning we would have $104 at the end of year one. If we were to have the ability to jump forward and backward in time, we would theoretically be indifferent between having the $100 sum today or the $104 sum one year from now on the assumption that this 4% growth rate is in fact the correct growth rate. This same concept can be extended over multiple periods on a compounded basis. For example, we would be indifferent between having $108.16 two years from now or having $100 today. The math behind this is very simple. We take the base amount at time zero and grow it by one plus the assumed growth rate. And if it's a constant growth rate, we will use exponents to compound the growth rate over multiple periods. The present value math is also quite simple. We're taking the future value and we divide it by one plus the growth rate. And if it's over multiple periods with a constant growth rate, we reflect that compounding as shown here or alternatively through the use of exponents in the denominator. As we know, Excel provides us with functions that will allow us to solve for these values easily. The FV function, which asks first for the rate, the number of periods, and in this case, we provide the present value to get us to the future value two years from now, and the PV function, which will take a future value and discount it at a constant rate over multiple periods. So it's important to understand that this 4% assumed growth rate through the lens of the time value of money is also the discount rate. The discount rate can be thought of as simply a growth rate applied in reverse or a rate of contraction as opposed to a rate of expansion. Next, let's move to the DCF timeline tab. The discounted cash flow model takes the concept of the time value of money and extends it into a practical application for valuing an investment, whether it be real estate or another business. When we perform a discounted cash flow analysis, we're essentially taking the present value of all of the future expected cash flows, adding all of those discounted amounts together, and then adding that discounted sum against the nominal time zero investment amount. If the net result or net present value is positive, the perception is that undertaking the investment at the assumed price with all of the assumed cash flows at the assumed discount rate creates value. If the result of the net present value calculation is negative, 
the transaction at all of the stated assumptions is destroying value. Naturally, we only want to pursue transactions that we perceive as creating value. Let's apply this now to a real estate scenario. We assume in this example that we will acquire a newly built and stabilized four tenant retail strip center. In the center are a dry cleaner, sandwich shop, a bakery, and a convenience store. We further assume that we buy the property all cash, so no debt financing is assumed, and that all of the leases are triple net, meaning the tenants will pay all of the expenses for the property, and the total of the leases across the four tenants is in the first year $60,000, and each of the leases has a 3% annual rent escalation clause. So the rent stream will grow by 3% annually on a compounded basis. We further assume that there is percentage rent in the leases, and we estimate that across all of the tenants, that amount will be $5,000 in year one, $5,500 in year two, and $6,000 in year three. Starting in cell F as in Frank 13, we show the cash investment at the point of closing on the property as a negative cash flow or cash outflow of $1 million. The next row down is our expected rent stream, but limited to the base rent. The base rent in year one is $60,000, and the base rent remains constant throughout the term of the lease. The next row shows the growth in those rents based off of the escalation factor in the leases. So in year one, we grow the $60,000 by the 3% raised to the current year number minus one and then deduct the base rent amount. As we know, the nominal rent and the real rent are one and the same in the first year as there is no growth during the first year. However, in the subsequent years, we see the escalation impacting the cash flow. The assumed percentage rents are in row 16 and then the sum of the three lines above is the expected return, taking into account both escalation on the leases as well as the assumed percentage rents. If we take a look at the growth in this cash flow stream, we can see the year-over-year -year growth is calculated as the current year amount divided by the prior year amount minus one. The cash-on-cash -cash return, which is shown in row 19, is calculated as the current year's expected return divided by the cash investment amount. Given there is no debt on the transaction and we're assuming that there are no capital expenditure cash flows, the cash on cash return here is rising from 6.5% to around 7% by the end of year three. Our expected net sale amount is shown in row 21, $1.15 million representing a 15% property value growth over the course of the three-year holding period. If we take a look at the cash flows in row 25, we see that there is a negative $1 million cash flow at time zero, total of 65,000 in year one, total of 67,300 in year two, and a total of 1.219 million in year three, which takes into account the sale cash flow as well as the operating cash flow. On a net basis, this is roughly $350,000. To reflect the risk of these cash flows, we now take the present value of each of these nominal amounts. Using the present value function, in year one we discount at our assumed constant 7% rate over one year. In year two, over two years. And in year three, over three years. The net present value can be solved for using the NPV function at the 7% discount rate or simply summing up the present values which we calculated and adding that against the time zero amount. So given all of these assumptions, we perceive a today's dollar value creation of $115,000 as opposed to the simple arithmetic net of $350,000. So at all of these given assumptions, this appears to be an exercise in value creation. And naturally, if we were to not discount at all, or discount at 
these amounts would match. But we are discounting. And so now the question becomes, how do we know what discount rate to select? From a practical perspective, the discount rate can be thought of as the opportunity cost of making this very investment. The opportunity cost is simply the cost related to the next best investment available, assuming we're picking between several mutually exclusive choices. As a result, we'll select the discount rate based on the level of return that similar stabilized investments are currently yielding in the market. And if we don't do that, then we might either be under or overestimating what the cash flows are really worth. So let's say we had perfect information about a very similar stabilized retail center. And we knew that the cash on cash return of that center was roughly 7%. Assuming all else equal, which unfortunately it never is, but assuming that everything else were the same, if we knew that the 7% was the yield on that investment, then theoretically that's the yield that we should be choosing. If we know that the yield on that other investment is greater than 7%, let's say 10%, and we were to discount at 10%, then what we're showing here is a much lower net present value. So this is barely creating value, in other words. And so maybe what we want to do is lower our intended price if the leases are already locked in. And so this is part of the calculus and part of the decision making that goes into pricing an asset. Another way that we can think about the discount rate is it's essentially a rate built upon a risk-free rate, such as a US Treasury bill. On top of the risk-free rate, we apply margins or premiums for the unique set of operating market and credit risks associated with this particular investment, as well as a liquidity premium, because no real estate is as liquid as a US Treasury bill. And naturally, the more margin that we place on top of the risk-free rate, the lower the perceived value will be of this investment. Next, let's flip to the DCF exercise tab. Here on the DCF exercise tab, your task is to extend this analysis to a four-year timeline by filling in all of the blue shaded cells. The assumption is that sale at the end of year four will be for $1.25 million and that there are individual distinct discount rates for each year of the transaction. In theory, every additional year into the future that we go out, there is more risk in the cash flow. And that is what this increasing set of discount rates is reflecting. Once you solve for the present value of each of the year's cash flows using the appropriate discount rates in your math, the net present value will calculate for you and you will be able to answer the question of what is the NPV. Press pause on the video now and do the work. Here on the DCF solution tab, I will walk through the answer line by line. Cell J11 is the base rent, and that is constant throughout, so that's the same. Cell J12 required that we simply copy this formula over to this cell, and it applies the escalation across all of the leases. Cell J13 is the first point at which our answers might diverge. I didn't explicitly tell you how much the percentage rent would be in year four. And so if you don't have 7,000 on your end, please go ahead and do key that in now so that we have matching amounts there. And the fact that I didn't tell you what it was is representative of the art portion of financial modeling. It's part science and part art. And there is no right answer standing here today as to what the percentage rent will be four years from now. So this was my projected number and we'll need to wait four years to see whether I was right or you were right if you had a different number. But it's a number that I chose to model. When we sum those three lines, we get $72,000. The year over year growth was simply taking the prior year's formula and copy and pasting it. Same for cash on cash return. And then we were asked to sell for 1.25 million and that is inputted here. The last task was to solve for the present value of each of these annual expected values. 
and different discount rates were provided for each of the years of the projection based on the theory that as we move further into the future, each successive year's cash flows are that much less certain than the prior year's cash flows. So while we used initially a constant 7% discount rate, here we're using this ascending discount rate. And the increments chosen are subjective. And there's, once again, no right or wrong answer there. Nonetheless, let's take a look at how the present value is correctly calculated for each of these years. For year one, it's quite simple. Take the annual amount and divide by one plus that year's discount rate. For year two, we need to take the product of the two discount rates as the denominator. So we take one plus the 7% for the year one period and multiply that by one plus the seven and a quarter percent for the current year. And that's our denominator. And by extension for year three, we take one plus seven percent for the first year times one plus seven and a quarter for the second year times one plus seven and a half for the current year. And this pattern extends for however many periods you have. The net present value is going to be naturally the sum of those present values added against the time zero nominal amount. You might have calculated this differently, where you said, I'm going to, instead of taking the year one rate, I'm going to compound the seven and a quarter percent rate. The larger the gulf between these two discount rates, the more difference there will be in the present values. You might be wondering why we don't simply square the seven and a quarter percent discount rate here and why we don't simply cube the seven and a half percent discount rate here. The rationale behind not doing that is we've already established that there is a particular level of risk to get us to this point of cash flow through the end of year one. And we have stated that that's 7%. And then we've stated that the additional risk to get us through year two is seven and a quarter percent for that year. If we allow this seven and a quarter percent to essentially filter back it invalidates our assessment of the level of risk for year one. As a result, we need to evaluate every year's risk at its own discount rate in this calculation. Next, let's flip to the residential refi one exercise.